So this is module two of test three of the new digital SAT paper versions. So we start out, as always, with our words and context questions, so just four of them on this section. According to botanists, a viburnum plant experiencing insect damage may develop irenium. I don't know what that is. A discolored felty growth on its leaf blades. A blank viburnum plant, a healthy viburnum plant, on the other hand. So that tells us we have a contrast. This doesn't sound very healthy, so that means this does have to be a healthy one. Nigerian-American author Tayu Cole's blank, his two passions, culminate in his 2017 book, which a fuck Effectively combines his original photographs with his poetic prose. I guess that's better than prosaic poetry. Poetic prose. Uh, so it, uh, his, well, his enthusiasm for. So indifference to that would not make sense. If you're passionate about something, you're not indifferent to it. Yeah. So his enthusiasm for them. Novelist so-and-so declines to blank the conventions of the science fiction genre in which she writes, and she has suggested that her readers appreciate her work precisely because of this willingness to thwart expectations. So if someone who thwarts expectations, that means she declines to adhere to or conform to. Adhere to, stick to, conform to. In Nature Poem, poet Tommy Pico portrays his blank the natural world by honoring the centrality of nature within his tribe's traditional beliefs while simultaneously expressing his distaste for being in wilderness settings himself. So we have a positive thing in terms of uh, his view of the natural world, and then we have a negative thing. So if you hold both positive and negative feelings towards something at the same time, you are ambivalent. Ambivalent. Main purpose. There shall be new roads wending. A new beating of the drum. Men's eyes shall have fresh seeing. Gray lives reprise their span. But under the sun's new being, completing what night began, there will be the same backs bending, the same sad feet shall drum when this night finds its ending and day shall have come. So, things stay the same. Some things are changing. Kind of like the old expression, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Hmm... Actually, I crossed one out that might actually be correct. Okay. The repetitiveness inherent in human life, so that, that's built into or that comes with... Uh, so, repetitiveness. That seems like the rewarding part. A new beating of the drum, so that's rewarding. So it's a question whether activity, yeah, that, 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 that's like a very literal reading. You want to avoid those when dealing with the poetry because uh, they're so often using figurative language. Refute, that's an extreme word that you don't tend to see in uh, correct answers. And then number four, that's not it at all. Yeah, so it's gonna have to be A. Number six. The following is adapted from Jane Austen's novel, Mansfield Park. The speaker, Tom, is considering staging a play at home with a group of his friends and family. They want the main purpose. We mean nothing but a little amusement among ourselves, just to vary the scene and exercise our powers in nothing new. We want no audience, no publicity. We may be trusted, I think, in choosing some play most perfectly unexceptionable, bull, uh, ordinary, and I can conceive no greater harm or danger to any of us in conversing in the elegant written language of some respectable author 
than so they just want to he wants them to use their own words so uh, the purpose is to you know that Tom wants to stage a very ordinary play it's not about being inoffensive not about that hmm okay maybe it is one No audience, no publicity, so I guess that does mean there's just only a small number of people. Unexceptionable, nobody will take exception to it. I guess I've missed that word. Unexceptional is ordinary. Unexceptionable means inoffensive, so that actually is the, the connection, and that is what we want there. Number seven, musician Joni Mitchell, who is also a painter, so they want the overall structure uses images she created for her album covers to emphasize ideas expressed in her music. For the cover of her album, Turbulent Indigo, she painted a striking self-portrait that closely resembles Van Gogh's self-portrait with bandaged ear. The image calls attention to the album's title song, in which Mitchell sings about the legacy of the post-impressionist painter, meaning Van Gogh. In that song, Mitchell also hints that she feels a strong artistic connection to Van Gogh, an idea that is reinforced by her imagery on the cover. That's kind of circular. I mean, the image calls attention to the album's title. Title song, and the title song is reinforced by the album cover. But it does present a claim and then give an example supporting that claim. It's not talking about a similarity between the two artists not saying that Van Gogh influenced Joni Mitchell and it doesn't talk about the songs it mentions one song so yeah strange that feels circular but anyway they didn't ask me number eight and they want to know how the uh, authors uh, the, the, these people referred to in text two would characterize the conclusion presented in text one so we want to make sure first of all that we understand that conclusion so astronomer Mark Holland and colleagues examined four white dwarfs small dense remnants of past stars in order to determine the composition of exoplanets that used to orbit those stars studying wavelengths of light in the white dwarf atmospheres the team reported that Traces of elements such as lithium and sodium, okay, they support the presence of exoplanets with continental crusts similar to Earth's crust. Okay. Past studies of white dwarf atmospheres have concluded that certain exoplanets had continental crusts. Geologist Keith Puturka and astronomer C.E. Zhu argue that those studies unduly or un unjustifiably or overly emphasize atmospheric traces of lithium and other individual elements as signifiers of the types of rock found on Earth. These studies don't adequately account for different minerals made up of various ratios of those elements and the possibility of rock types not found on Earth that contain those minerals. So they would, they would have a negative characterization of it. questionable. It rests on incomplete consideration of potential sources of the elements. Yep. So, focus on what they're asking about. The conclusion and yeah, so that is going to be that one. Number nine. So this is just a little explicit detail question. Why are they worried about Pando? So Utah is home to Pando, a colony of about 47,000 quaking aspen trees that all share a single root system. Pando is one of the largest single organisms by mass on Earth, but ecologists are worried that it's... Okay. They are worried that its growth is declining because of grazing by animals. And bingo. So these kind of questions, you don't get a whole lot of them on the new SAT, the digital SAT, but you want to take advantage of them and make sure you get them right because the answer should be explicitly stated in the path.
passage. And here is another one. <laughs> okay, so we get two on this test. Usually I haven't seen two per test or two per module. So why were they, why was this significant? So for many years, the only existing fossil evidence of mixopterid eurypterids, say that 20 times fast, an extinct family of large aquatic arthropods known as sea scorpions and related to modern arachnids and horseshoe crabs, came from four species living on the paleo continent of La Russia. In a discovery that extends our understanding of the geographical distribution of mixopterids, paleontologist Bo Wang and others have identified fossilized remains of a new mixopterid species. So they have remains of a new species. Now, A has an extreme word, first. Why is that extreme? Well, this is saying literally it's the, you know, the absolute first, that there had been no evidence before. And it's not saying that. It's saying that these fossilized remains lived you know, dated back more than 400 million years, but it doesn't say that it's the first evidence that they lived. It doesn't change anything in terms of their relation to horseshoe crabs or whatever. Um, no. The fossil helps establish a more accurate timeline of the evolution of mixopterids. Maybe. Hmm, well here might be, this might be a, a case where I'm looking at D and I see the word first. But it does say, okay, the only existing evidence came from four species living on La Russia, if that's how you pronounce it. They identified this one on Gondwana. So it actually is the first evidence. geographical distribution so it doesn't say anything about the timeline so that's what, okay so this is a good example how when you see a word like first you do want to be cautious but it doesn't mean that it can't be right it just means that you need equally extreme evidence to back it up so only first so that does work 11. Which would most strongly support the scholar's claim? The novelist Toni Morrison was first the first black woman to work as an editor at the publishing company Random House. A scholar asserts that one of her likely aims was to strengthen the presence of black writers on the list of Random House's published authors. which finding would support that claim. So, well, well, if it rose and then, I mean, maybe. Not about the influence on their work. Boy, that's definitely not it. No, so it would have to be A. Well, the poet Walt Whitman is a 1987 essay by Jose Marti, so we want something that most effectively illustrates the claim. In the essay, Marti explores the value of literature, arguing that a society's spiritual well-being depends on the character of its literary culture. Poetry is more necessary to a people than industry itself. For the industry provides them with the means of subsistence. Literature gives them desire and strength for life. So is that spiritual well-being? I think it is. I think that's going to be it, but let's see. It's not about the history of nations. That has nothing to do with it at all. 
Yep, so pay attention to the question stem, and that should lead you to the right answer. In this case, it's a claim, and then we have to read the claim, and it is well-being of a society, a spiritual society. Society, spiritual well-being depends on the character of its literary culture. Yes. Number 13. So data from the table that supports the suggestion. So we're going to read this, get clear on what the suggestion is, then find the data from the table, and then go to the answer choices. So the li largest tyrannosaurids, the family of carnivorous dinosaurs that includes these types, are thought to have had the strongest bites of any land animals in Earth's history. Determining the bite force of extinct animals can be difficult, however, and paleontologists Paul Barrett and Emily Rayfield have suggested that an estimate of dinosaur bite force, the force of dinosaur bites, may be significantly influenced by the methodology used in generating that estimate. Okay, so what we would need to find here is, you know, two of these that differ quite a bit. And as I look at these, I see that these two methods are similar, so they're probably not going to be used, at least not together, whereas these two are really, really different. Oh, but these, <laughs> never mind, these use the same meth method, and they come up with a pretty similar estimate. These use different methods, and they come up with different estimates. So it's not about which one had the biggest. It's about similar versus different. It's not about the differences in these two because they are basically not that different. They're pretty similar. So these two were similar to each other and the others were very different. Another graph question here, table question. So same idea, data to support the research team's conclusion. So we'll read it and get to the conclusion. So studying tools on earth at a cave site on the western coast of Italy, they determined that prehistoric Neanderthal groups fashioned them, the tools, made the tools from shells of clams that they harvested from the seafloor while wading or diving, or clam shells that washed up on the beach. Clam shells become thin and eroded as they wash up on the beach while those on the seafloor are smooth and sturdy, so the research team suspects that Neanderthals prized the tools, highly valued the tools made with seafloor shells. However, the team also concluded that those tools were likely more challenging to obtain, so seafloor shells more challenging to obtain there are fewer of them at all depths so three to four six to seven meters that's a weird way of making that graph shouldn't <laughs> shouldn't it go <laughs> Two, three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six, seven. But anyway, um, in any event, there are fewer at each depth. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that they, you know, they might have preferred one, but just not been able to find as many of them. Yet another table question, number 15. Um, data that supports the researcher's hypothesis. When hibernating, Alaska marmots and Arctic ground squirrels enter a state called torpor, which minimizes the energy their bodies need to function. Often, a hibernating animal will temporarily come out of torpor, called an arousal episode, and its metabolic rate will rise, burning more of the precious energy the animal needs to survive the winter. Alaska marmots hibernate in groups and therefore burn less energy, keeping warm during these episodes than they would if they were alone. A researcher hypothesized that because ground squirrels hibernate alone, Arctic ground squirrels would likely exhibit longer bouts of torpor and shorter arousal episodes. So Arctic ground squirrels compared to Alaska marmots. So their bouts of torpor, 
this is the number of bouts, but the important thing is this one, the duration per bout. How long do they last? And then the arousal episodes, the same thing. That's the number, but this is how long they last. So the direction of the comparison, we want to go from here to there, meaning longer duration for torpor, shorter duration for arousal. That's just not accurate. They both lasted less than a day. Yeah. That's a similarity. The Alaska marmots had shorter torpor bouts. Well, that's true. And longer arousal. So yeah, it's the same idea. C is what we want. It's just saying it in the reverse direction. Right. If if this is longer than that, this is shorter than that. If this is shorter than that. This is longer than that. So, um, yep. So that'll be C number sixteen. So we're on to logically completing the text for two questions. So these are inference questions. Ratified by more than 90 countries, the Nagoya Protocol is an international agreement ensuring that indigenous communities are compensated when their agricultural resources and knowledge of wild plants and animals are utilized by agricultural corporations. However, the protocol has shortcomings. For example, it allows corporations to insist that their agreements with communities to conduct research on the commercial uses of the community's resources and knowledge remain confidential. Okay. So if they remain confidential, then things can't be shared. Therefore, some indigenous advocates express concern that the protocol may have the unintended effect of increasing secrecy. Hmm. Well, <laughs> we're not worried that the that about diminishing the monetary reward that corporations would derive. That's not what indigenous people are not going to worry that hey, this corporation isn't going to make enough money off of us. Limiting the research that corporations conduct on the resources. No, because if they have signed agreements, they're not worried about that. Preventing independent observers from determining whether the agreements... Yeah, because if this is a kind of secrecy. If there's sec I know you can't read that, but increasing secrecy. If there's secrecy, then you can't have independent observers look in and determine whether they are getting a fair deal. And that's something that the indigenous people would worry about. Um, this is it's not about learning from their corporate partners their corporate partners are going to try to learn from them 17 the domestic sweet potato derives descends from a wild plant native to south america it also populates the polynesian islands where evidence confirms that native hawaiians and other indigenous <laughs> every passage mentions indigenous people um uh, were cultivating the plant centuries before seafaring first occurred over the thousands of miles of ocean separating them from South America. To explain how the sweet potato was first introduced in Polynesia, this botanist analyzed the DNA of numerous varieties of the plant, concluding that Polynesian varieties diverged from South American ones over 100,000 years ago. So we have the sweet potato that was native to South America, but also in the Polynesian islands, which is far away from South America, to explain how it was first introduced to Polynesia. They analyzed the DNA and concluded that, okay, there was a divergence, so they split off. So 100,000 years ago, there was a divergence. So the ones that are still grown in South America are different from the ones in Polynesia. Given that Polynesia was peopled only in the last 3,000 years, well, the cultivation likely predates its cultivation. No, 
if it's native to South America, you know, Polynesian peoples likely acquired it from the South American peoples only within the last 3,000 years. Well, that wouldn't make sense because um, they diverged 100,000 years ago. Human activity likely played no role in the introduction. I don't know, that feels extreme, but it's possible. It descends uh, where evidence comes native were cultivating the plant centuries before seafaring first occurred. So people were growing it before any seafaring came from South America. But still, the varieties diverged 100,000 years ago, but the people, that means there were 97,000 years, basically, at least 97,000 years in which the, they were growing and there were no people. So even though that feels extreme, at least it says likely played no role. They would have had to have gotten there somehow. I don't know, maybe a bird picked it up and carried it over. So now we're onto a different kind of question. Standard English conventions, and these will probably go up to about number 26 or so. So atoms in a synchro synchrotron, a type of circular particle accelerator, travel faster and faster until they reach, until they reach. This is all just verb tense. Until they reach a desired energy level. 19. Even though bats prefer very sweet nectar, the plants that attract them have evolved to produce nectar that is only moderately sweet. A recent study explains why. And that's strange because usually, well, okay. I was going to say it's subject-verb agreement, but it isn't really. And what would have been strange for a subject-verb agreement question would, to be, would be to have the subject go right next to the verb. Usually they don't do that. Usually if they're going to ask about subject-verb agreement, they're going to separate them to make it a little harder. This one is just about coming up with a word that gives us a complete sentence because none of these, none of these are verbs that can be, you know, these aren't conjugated verbs. They can't take a tense. So you need an independent clause before the colon. And that's the only one that gives us that. A recent study explains why. Former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and Indian activist and educator Hans Amedo were instrumental in drafting the UN Declaration of Human Rights, a document that outlines. A document that outlines. So, you don't want to say a document that outline. And we notice here that this is a kind of, kind of subject-verb agreement, in, in a sense, um, that document is singular and the only one of these words that are or, or answer choices that pairs with a singular is C. A and B those are plural and so is that. So again, it's not really the subject of a sentence but it is kind of you know it's a noun verb agreement. 21 and the first thing we see here is this and it means that both of those are going to be incorrect because the period equals the semicolon except in rare cases but in a case like this where you see those two options they're both going to be identical meaning you can cross them both out so do we want a colon or do we want a comma let's see for instance the colorful calico rockfish can survive for a little over a blank while the rough eye rockfish so definitely a comma yes so, we have this first portion, and then the second portion. This one can do this, while this other one can do this other thing. So that's definitely going to be D. 22, some kind of punctuation question. The Lion Light System consists of LED lights installed around the perimeter of livestock pastures, powered with blank, comma, the blinking LED LEDs keep lions away at night. So it needs a comma at the very end of it. So we can eliminate A and B because they don't have a comma there. And then the difference between C and D is that D is going to make it look like that portion is an interruption, 
and a positive, and that's not. It's not that. It's going to have to be C. Powered with energy collected by solar panels during the day, comma. So collected by solar panels during the day is not an interruption here, meaning it's not something that we could take out. Uh, I guess you could take it out, but it's what you would call an integrated modifier, meaning it's integrated into the flow of this portion of the sentence. It's not a, an interruption. <laughs> Funny looking answer choices. Um, that they believe they could improve on the multi-component alloy NiCoCr, an equal proportions mixture of nickel, cobalt, and chromium, by replacing chromium with ruthenium, comma. Okay, so we do need a comma, but we also need a conjunction. And so here, that's kind of incidental because all of them have that. So we need a comma and then but. So this would have to do with a comma splice kind of issue. This is an independent clause. And this whole thing is ultimately an independent clause. So if we're going to join two independent clauses like this, we need both the comma and the conjunction. And so that's why it's going to be D. some combination of verb and I'm gonna say I'm gonna take a guess here now we want to read the sentence but notice looking at the answer choices that we have one singular and three plural so it's very likely that the correct answer is going to be a now it might not be a if this has to do with the verb tense but I let's just see Among the club's leaders was Josephine Pierre. Josephine St. Pierre was among the club's leaders. So this is a little unusual in the sense that our subject, this person, the subject comes after the verb. And I think what might happen on this one for a lot of students, or some students, is you might read too quickly and see leaders and go leaders were. But again, that's why paying attention to the structure of the answer choices can be helpful on these um, because if it is a subject verb agreement and you have one that's one way and three that are the other way, it's probably the one that's different that's going to be correct. Based on genetic evidence, archaeologists have generally agreed that reindeer domestication began in the 11th, 11th century AD, CE, AD. However, since uncovering fragments of a 2,000 year old reindeer training harness in northern Siberia, blank may have begun much earlier. So this, I do believe, is going to be a modifier, a dangling modifier question. This portion here is our modifier, and it essentially opens the sentence. I mean, however, yeah, that's there, but just think of it this way. Since uncovering fragments of a 2,000-year-old reindeer, we want to ask who or what, it's going to be who, but who or what uncovered these fragments? because that's our modifier. And the answer to that question is going to be, well, whoever or whatever uncovered those fragments, that should be the noun that comes right after the comma. Researcher Robert Losey or Losey. So notice here that B looks pretty similar, but the noun that B gives us is his argument. And it wasn't his argument that uncovered the fragments. It was he himself who did it. it. Certainly wasn't domestication that uncovered them, and it wasn't the argument. Yeah. So these are turning out to be pretty common, pretty frequent on the new SAT, I mean, proportionally more common than they are in the current one, although you do see them. But the way you can tell a dangling modifier question is like this. You have some kind of introductory modifier, then you have a comma, and then you have the underlined portion, or the blank. And then you're going to have your answer choices start out with totally different words. And so that is that. 26. Hegra is an archaeological site in present-day Saudi Arabia and was the second largest city of this kingdom. Archaeologist so-and-so has recently traveled to Hegra to study its ancient blank. Built into the rocky outcrops of a vast desert, these burial chambers. Yes, so we definitely need a period there. 
And so what do we, why do we need a period? Because this is an independent clause. And then this is another independent clause. And even though built into the rocky outcrops of a vast desert is itself a dependent clause, we've eventually got another independent clause. And so you don't want to, just like you don't want to do this with two independent clauses and just a comma, you also don't want to string them together in such a way that you have an independent clause, some dependent clause, and then another independent clause with just a comma. So both of those are going to be no-nos. We need a period here. And you could have had a semicolon, but as I mentioned before, the semicolon and the period are, are interchangeable for, for these kinds of purposes on the SAT. When external forces are applied to common glass made from silicates, energy builds up around minuscule defects in the material, resulting in fractures. Recently, so-and-so used the chemical aluminum, chemical compound aluminum oxide to make a glassy solid. Yeah. So this is all about whether or not we want to treat aluminum oxide as an interruption. And one thing I like to emphasize on these kinds of questions is the correct answer is either going to involve two commas or no comma meaning that ones like A and B are going to be incorrect. It's a question of whether we take this portion and you know, whether that portion is an interruption. And if it is an interruption, you should be able to take it out and then read the rest of the material that remains and it should make sense. Let's try it here. Engineer so-and-so used the chemical compound to make a glassy solid. Well, we don't know which chemical compound. So that tells us that aluminum oxide is not an interruption, and therefore we do not want punctuation. So it's going to just be D. 28. Transition. Etched into the uh, Nazca Desert are line drawings so large they can only be fully seen from high above. Archaeologists have known of the line since the 1920s when a researcher spotted from a nearby foothole, spotted some from a nearby foothill, and they have been studying the markings ever since blank archaeologist efforts are aided by drones that capture high resolution something like now uh, nowadays currently yes so they're saying they've known of them since the 20s they've been studying them ever since now they're able to use these tools that they did not have in the past so currently i guess nowadays would be a little un uh informal but it's the right idea at least 29. Archaeologist Sue Brunning explains why the 7th century ship burial site at Sutton Hoo in England was likely the tomb of a king. First, the gold artifacts inside the ship suggest that the person buried with them was a wealthy and respected leader. Second, the massive effort to bury the ship would likely have only been undertaken for a king. So first, second. First, additionally. First, moreover. So they're giving an additional example that lines up with the first one. 30. The more diverse and wide-ranging an animal's behavior, the larger and more energy-demanding the animal's brain tends to be. Blank. From an evolutionary perspective, animals that perform only basic actions should advocate fewer resources to growing and maintaining brain tissue. The specialized subtypes of ants within colonies provide an opportunity to explore this. Okay, so they're making a claim and they're saying something that follows from that. Follow, something that follows from the claim. So they're not giving a sequence, so subsequently. They're not doing besides. Yeah, so thus. You can put thus in the same basic category with therefore, consequently, Even, although it's not the exact same thing, you can even throw hints in there. And if you want to distinguish between the fine, you know, the fine shades of meaning that separate thus and hence and therefore, you can look those up online. But uh, they're close enough that they're not going to make you choose between them. When designing costumes for film, American artist so-and-so typically custom fits the garments to each actor. For the film Sunshine, she designed a golden space chute and had a factory reproduce it in a few standard sizes. Lacking a tailor-made quality, the final creations reflected the ungainliness of actual spacesuits. So here, she typically custom fits the garments for each actor. Despite this, 
she just had it a factory you know so n this is um you know despite this they could have said however um surprised they didn't have for example because if you read it casually or not carefully enough you might think oh they're going to give an example but they're saying no here's how she typically does it but in this case she did it differently for specific reasons and then on to our notes questions so with these we want to read the question first and focus on what they're asking it to do so a similarity between the two books surreal events occurring in otherwise suburban other ordinary suburban neighborhoods surreal events occurring in otherwise ordinary urban settings so the similarity is that one is suburban no the similarity is that both describe severe surreal events occurring in otherwise ordinary neighborhoods yes so the similarities in the places and these are already kind of becoming just as I've gone through these practice tests they're almost like clockwork it's just like and you look at the description the question and only one answer choice will address the you know what they've asked them to do the aim of the study so there so here we want to stay away from the findings and just the, just get to the aim and that's it they wanted to know this because they've been studied in birds but not in lizards and so that will be our answer